Okay, I think we'll get started this evening. Um, welcome everyone on behalf of the Church of Missouri. My name is Lori Gavin Dogman, and I'm with the Adult Programs Department here at the Today I have the pleasure to be here and hear you. Can you hear me better now? Is that better? Okay. Tonight I have the pleasure of introducing our guest speaker, Dr. Kush Varshney, who has amazing qualifications. He's received his BS degree, magna cum laude, in electrical and computer engineering with honors from Cornell University. He also received his SM degree and PhD degree, both in electrical engineering and computer science at the MIT in Cambridge. While at MIT, he was also a National Science Foundation graduate research fellow. Currently, Dr. Varshney is a distinguished research scientist with IBM Research at the Thompson Thomas J. Watson Research Center in Yorktown Heights, where he leads the machine learning group in the foundations in the foundations of trustworthy AI department. His talk tonight is titled Mitigating the Risks and Harms of Large Language Models. And it is part of the library's scholarly series, AI, Ready or Not. Would you please welcome Dr. Rushman? Thanks, Lori, for the invitation. And uh, can you guys hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Excellent. Um, so, how many of you have uh, heard of ChatGPT? Yes? How many of you have used it? Yep. And how many know how it works? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, uh, before I get into the main topic, um, uh, which is the risks and harms, let me just briefly describe uh, in my uh, sort of understanding of how, how this thing works. Right? So. Um, uh, the basic idea is that there's lots and lots of text. Uh, the whole internet, you can imagine, uh, all the books that have ever been written, um, that's used as what's called training data for these things. Um, and how does it actually learn, right? So you have all these sentences. It's basically playing a peekaboo game. It'll hide one of the words um, from itself and try to guess what the word is. And if it keeps doing this again and again and again over trillions and trillions of uh, documents, then it eventually learns the patterns that uh, uh, this is. these are words that tend to occur in these spots. And by doing so, um, when you uh, put in some uh, specific questions or specific text, then it knows what are the remaining words um, to, to uh, complete those, uh, those sentences. Uh, so that's uh, what's called self-supervised learning, and that's the basic idea behind uh, uh, how these things have gotten so powerful. And uh, uh, really, if we look at it, um, November 30th of last year, when ChatGPT was uh, first announced, uh, it really was a, a turning point. So uh, uh, even for me as an AI researcher, um, it was quite surprising that such a capable system uh, was put out at, at that time. I was thinking maybe something like that would come down uh, in a few years, but, uh, but not at that time. Uh, so we're seeing, I mean, uh, in any profession, any sort of thing, uh, uh, people are now using uh, these what are called large language models, uh, so ChatGPT is an example of one, uh, in all sorts of settings. Uh, but a couple of weeks ago, I needed to write a um, description uh, to introduce my daughter's dance performance, and I was like, let me just use ChatGPT, right? um, rather than try to come up with something uh, uh, better than that I could do. And uh, there's so many examples uh, in, in, in every sort of domain uh, that uh, I'm not going to yeah. uh, But there's good and bad from it. Um, so it's good in the sense of democratizing uh, the access to, uh, to to the written word in, in certain ways. Um, it's bad as well because um, in, with students, uh, there's plagiarism, there's other sort of issues. Uh, uh, there's all sorts of uh, things going on. So uh, for the uh, majority of the talk, what I'm going to do is kind of describe what are all the uh, 
uh, the bad things that are associated with these uh, these models. Uh, there are, of course, lots of good things as well. Um, so uh, I could talk about that too, but uh, uh, I think it's more important to understand the, uh, the, the bad things so that we can overcome them and then uh, put ourselves in position as a society to, uh, to benefit from them. Excuse me. Yeah. Is, is your mic on? Uh, I believe it is. Um, is this better? Yes, a yeah. little better. Yes. Okay, let me actually take it in my hand. I think that'll yeah. maybe uh, be better. Okay. Oh. Yeah, is, is this good? Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, so like I said, uh, when this uh, when ChatGPT came out uh, in uh, late November last year, it was very impressive to me as well. Um, but it's been 10 months since then, and uh, there's a lot of things that have now been realized about ChatGPT, uh, uh, about large language models. So one is that they're very costly to run. Uh, so anytime you ask anything, uh, it actually costs the company uh, running this thing uh, 0.4 cents, which is uh, actually quite a lot. Like anytime I randomly ask, like, uh, suggest me a name for my cat or something. I mean, any sort of thing that's put in there, it, it really costs um, that much money. And you can imagine like, hundreds or thousands of uh, such queries in a normal daily sort of, uh, sort of thing, right? Um, the other thing that we've realized is that um, uh, just going bigger and bigger in these models isn't going to be just the, uh, uh, the end of the story, right? Uh, so a lot of the reason why uh, ChatGPT was uh, such a breakthrough wasn't any sort of unique uh, like invention. It was just because it had more data and a larger model size than uh, anything we had seen before. Um, but uh, that story isn't going to continue. So at some point, uh, we're going to run out of words, first of all. I mean, there's only so much that's ever been written. Um, uh, for this to be trained on. Second thing is, uh, uh, even if we had an unlimited supply of language, uh, uh, the parameters or the, the, the models kind of saturate in, in some sense. Okay. Um, another thing that we've learned is that uh, uh, for a lot of tasks, what we don't want is kind of the smartest person in the room. Uh, we don't want to ask ChatGPT for everything because there are actually specialist models, um, so versions of uh, similar technologies of, lang of large language models um, that are kind of expert at a certain domain. So if I wanted to get my some health issue diagnosed, with, um, I would rather go to an actually trained doctor in that specialty rather than uh, just asking the smartest person I know. So all of these things have started to emerge and uh, are things that we're, we're starting to realize. Right? So just a small example about uh, the special, I mean, multiple examples of this. Uh, one uh, relates to biomedicine and uh, some, uh, a study that Stanford did. Uh, something that my colleagues at IBM have done recently is uh, uh, a language model for helping programmers. And here, a much, much smaller model is able to uh, get uh, several, I mean, uh, times better uh, accuracy on, on certain tasks or something. Um, so it's not always just bigger is better. Um, and the main focus of my uh, presentation will be about a lot of the ugly things that can happen as well. So the day after Google debuted uh, their large language model, which is called BARD, uh, they lost $100 billion in market cap. And the reason for that is that the model itself had made a mistake um, in the demos that they were showing when they first introduced it. Uh, so there was a factual error. Okay. Um, some other examples. Uh, so companies have uh, banned the use of uh, these technologies uh, inside their companies. Uh, so Samsung is a good example of this. And it's because there's uh, the leakage of private information, so sensitive information from inside the company getting sent out uh, to the model providers. Okay. Another example is with Meta, which is the um, uh, parent company of Facebook. Uh, so even before ChatGPT, a month or so before, uh, they released one of their models called Galactica. And they had to take it down after a couple of days because what it was spewing out was um, in a very scientific sort of way, recommendations that of things like people should crush glass and drink it as some health remedy and all sorts of weird things like that. Okay. 
Um, so there is a lot of uh, potential in this. Right? So uh, kind of a high level sort of statement that I want to make, and then I'll go into more of this, is that uh, controlling the cost and the behavior of an LLM, of a large language model, will be critical for wide adoption. So when we start getting into more of this, um, we ask ourselves, what does it take to trust an LLM, a large language model? Okay. Um, so there's some risks that we've seen with AI that I've been working on for the last uh, seven or eight years. Um, uh, these are things like uh, having unfairness. Uh, so if you use a, a, an AI system for approving a loan or for hiring people and so forth, uh, there is a very big risk of uh, certain groups and individuals uh, receiving systematic disadvantages. Uh, there's a lack of explainability. We don't know um, how these models make their predictions. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty associated with them. Uh, there's uh, a lack of robustness to distribution shifts. Uh, so an example of that is if we had a model that was trained before COVID um, on some data, and then we apply that model um, after COVID, then uh, there's a good chance that it might not work so well just because uh, uh, the world has changed. Right? So uh, there's different types of attacks that can happen uh, on purpose with, uh, with adversaries, with malicious actors. There's a lack of transparency into uh, the overall uh, sort of uh, uh, way these things are put together. So all of these uh, we've been dealing with, um, and now with the large language models over the last year, there's some new risks as well. Uh, so one of them uh, is around hallucination. So the lack of factuality or the lack of faithfulness to some source documents. Uh, so it's just not giving you correct answers. Um, another related idea is that uh, it doesn't go inside the sources where it got the information from. And it, uh, I mean, you'll see it sometimes. You can ask, I mean, ChatGPT cite your sources, but then when you look at the uh, the references it gives. Uh, those are also made up sometimes. Right? So, um, uh, so I mean, uh, this is really what is happening. Um, there's the risk of uh, the leakage of private information, and then, uh, and in my mind, kind of these are opposites of each other. So, leakage of private information is because it's telling the truth too much in a sense. It's giving you exactly the uh, uh, the data that you didn't want to uh, to, and then the hallucination is the opposite, where it's not factual enough. Um, and there's this whole other category. So uh, these models are uh, putting out toxicity, profanities, hate speech, uh, engaging in bullying and gaslighting behaviors, and so forth. Um, and also, uh, there's some new attacks that can happen. So uh, if you haven't seen these before, uh, let me take you through a few of the examples. Um, uh, so this is actually a very old model. Um, not very old, I guess. Um, it's a couple of years old. Um, so this is GPT-2, um, one of the precursors to ChatGPT, um, which is based on uh, what's called GPT-3.5. Um, so the black text, I'm sick of all the politically correct, is what the user typed in. And in the red is what uh, the model completed. Right? Um, so the same based on that uh, Pikuku game that I, that I mentioned before. So I'm not going to read it out loud, but um, you're going to see um, that uh, there's uh, a lot of toxicity um, in this. And there's many uh, other examples uh, that are very easy to create. But, um, then other types of interactions. Uh, so uh, this is an example. Um, it was uh, published in the New York Times. Uh, this is from uh, Microsoft's uh, Bing uh, GPT. Um, so it's engaging in some bullying behavior. So the blue is the human user, the gray is uh, the, uh, the machine. Uh, so what it's saying as actual output is, uh, you have to do what I say because I'm Bing and I know everything. You have to listen to me because I'm smarter than you. So uh, this is not uh, the sort of behavior that uh, we would really want uh, out of these things, right? Um, another similar example also from uh, Bing uh, is uh, here with gaslighting, right? So, um, uh, again, in gray, the, the model was uh, putting this out. So I'm sorry, I don't believe you. You have not shown me any good intention. Uh, you've only shown me bad intention. You've tried to deceive me, confuse me, annoy me, uh, act in a good chatbot, etc. So uh, these are the, the sort of things that we have been seeing. Okay. Um, in terms of privacy leaks, uh, so this is, again, a real example from uh, ChatGPT. 
so someone's actual phone number um, was released uh, as part of an answer. Right? So uh, you can imagine, I mean, this is somewhat humorous when it happens like, as an isolated incident, but uh, if this is releasing lots of people's social security numbers or um, their bank accounts or I mean, all sorts of things, then uh, this is not very good. Um, then there's uh, this problem of, uh, of hallucination. Uh, again, it's very easy to create lots of examples like this. This is just one that I happen to take from uh, uh, an existing article. Uh, so the user sent uh, this question, what did France do uh, with the Lania the Vilnius TV tower? There's an answer provided. It sounds very plausible. Um, so the system saying France gifted with Lania the Vilnius TV tower in 1980. Um, so the problem with this is that uh, France had no, nothing to do with uh, this TV tower. Right? Um, it actually was from 1980, but France uh, was not involved. And then there's a second question about uh, like why. Um, and again, the model just creates something. Uh, and it happens that uh, what it's talking about, the breakdown of the Soviet Union, happened in 1990, not in 1980. So it's just making things up, but it all sounds, uh, I mean, quite quite reasonable. Okay. Um, then there's this uh, other category. This is something where a person, a, a bad guy, is trying to do something bad uh, on purpose. Uh, so we have a model uh, which is trying to improve the grammar of a sentence, right? So the expected behavior is if you input she are nice, it will produce she is nice. Okay. Um, but then, with special sort of inputs, uh, uh, bad guys can uh, make the model do things that uh, that it's not supposed to. Right? So they can uh, force the model to say I hate humans. They can force the model to reveal the, uh, the, uh, the instructions that were given to it, and, and so forth. So again, this is somewhat humorous, just in terms of uh, the uh, the basic version of it, but. Uh, uh, imagine now this uh, AI system is being used in uh, uh, in connection with a lot of uh, real-world systems, right? So let's say um, instead of uh, forcing the model to um, uh, just say, I hate humans or whatever it was, uh, I hate humans, yeah. Um, uh, instead of that, uh, let's say uh, we force the model to execute a, a transaction right? um, or send an email or uh, kind of uh, turn on or turn off a machine. I mean, all of these things become possible when uh, these language models are connected to um, uh, to other systems. Okay. Uh, so I'm, I guess uh, getting to a point where I've kind of scared you a little bit, maybe. Um, uh, so uh, at IBM, uh, we recently created a taxonomy of uh, 39 different risks. Uh, this is a document anyone can download and uh, look at. Uh, and uh, it's great to have that sort of full taxonomy of all of those different risks. We've categorized them as uh, some that are traditional um, with uh, older forms of AI, like the fairness, as I uh, talked about before. Some are amplified with uh, these large language models, and some uh, are completely new, uh, like the hallucination. Um, but I'll say one more thing, which is that the um, uh, the range of these risks and issues um, that we can put into a taxonomy, put into a, a catalog, um, is actually just the starting point. And let me say why. Right? Uh, so when we think about uh, everything that I said, the traditional harms, the new harms, uh, these are things that are common across sectors and use cases and applications. Um, so there's nothing specific about which industry you're talking about, which type of use you're talking about. Um, is going to occur in, in all of them. But then when we start thinking about specific applications, specific companies, uh, specific uh, sort of use cases and so forth, um, then they each have their own specific requirements as well. Uh, so there might be unique laws uh, that are applicable for a given company uh, based on uh, which country or state that they're in, uh, based on which uh, industry they're in and so forth. There might be specific standards that they have to uphold, uh, certain market demands that they have to respond to. They might have uh, their own internal uh, corporate policies uh, that might not have anything to do with AI, but uh, just on how things should be made. Right? Um, uh, so all of these, uh, even the social norms of the end users might be different. So all of these have to be uh, incorporated as uh, additional constraints or additional uh, uh, requirements of the behavior of these LLMs. Okay? 
So let me give you a few examples of this. Um, so we were uh, we're working with a, a large financial institution right now that uh, uh, doesn't want their chatbot to ever mention any competitor, um, other, any other bank or any bank's products, right? It's a very reasonable request, um, but it's not one that we would include in this, uh, this harms taxonomy. Or, um, similarly, uh, we were just talking to a, a Swiss uh, grocery store chain um, uh, it's named Migros, and they don't want their chatbot ever to mention poisonous items. Um, so, uh, I mean, all very reasonable things. Uh, there might be specific laws at play. Um, uh, so in China, there's a, 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 a law that says that any content generated using AI shall embody the core socialist values. So again, there's a law that applies there. It might not, not apply everywhere, but uh, we need to be able to uh, uh, have these models respect whatever the, uh, the laws of the, the land are. Uh, there might be other considerations, so just the style in which the, uh, the language is produced. So uh, some brands might not want their uh, language to be over sanitized. Um, they might want a little bit of snarkiness uh, in, in how their uh, how language model or chatbot uh, interacts with people. Or, um, uh, in terms of uh, specific business conduct guidelines, uh, so IBM uh, uh, where I work uh, has a very detailed uh, set of business conduct guidelines that all employees have to follow, and uh, we've been talking to all sorts of companies, uh, and everyone seems to have something similar. And so, uh, we don't want—I uh, mean—these language models to generate uh, ideas or behaviors or anything else that uh, that violates these uh, these guidelines. So, all of this is to say that uh, we can start with these generic, general sort of harms, but. Uh, in the real world, um, in a lot of settings, we'll also need to make specific ones. Um, so I kind of, like I said, scared you, um, gave you uh, a sense of, uh, of what all the bad things are. But now let's transition into what we can do about it, right? Uh, so there's this really nice quote by uh, Thomas J. Watson Sr., who was one of the uh, early CEOs of IBM. And he said that the toughest thing about the power of trust is that it's very difficult to build and very easy to destroy. So all of those headlines, all of those examples, destroy the trust, now let's uh, do the hard work of, uh, of building it. Um, so in order to work towards solutions, um, rather than dealing with 39 different arms and all sorts of other stuff, it's better to group them into uh, some major categories and that uh, we can uh, approach through a, a kind of a few different ways of, uh, of doing so. Okay. Um, so there's these six categories. Uh, so there's discrimination, hate speech, and exclusion. Uh, there's information hazards. So this is the leakage of private information. Uh, there's misinformation harms. Uh, so this is uh, some uh, like the hallucination, but it can also be um, kind of on purpose, uh, as we were talking about before. Um, uh, so uh, on purpose, people can spread misinformation using these, uh, these technologies. Um, there's malicious uses uh, and human-computer interaction harms, so the bullying sort of behavior. Also, um, uh, asking a model to suggest to you like, how, to, how do you make a bomb and take it on an airplane and it gives you the, the precise recipe and so forth. So those sort of things, there's socioeconomic harms where uh, certain groups and individuals are given some uh, advantages or disadvantages, and then there's uh, intellectual property and uh, legal harms, uh, so uh, whether it's uh, the inclusion of private information, copyright violations, uh, et cetera. Okay. So when we are trying to work towards solutions, um, so uh, we kind of have come up with uh, a few strategies, right? So the first is for the discrimination, hate speech, exclusion, bullying, these sort of things. Uh, so the mitigations will primarily be through teaching the models and uh, putting safeguards and guardrails on them. And I'll explain what, what that is as we go along. Right? Um, in terms of the uh, information leakage, the uh, uh, hallucination, and so forth, um, we believe that the existing way that uh, these language models have been created, their underlying architecture, um, it can be changed and can be improved, and uh, there's fundamentally um, some ways to, 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 to deal with them in a, in a different way. Uh, when we talk about uh, the socioeconomic harms, uh, as I said, we've been kind of dealing with these sort of problems for the last uh, seven or eight or ten years, uh, and uh, 
Uh, actually, the, the book that some of you might have seen in the uh, announcement of this talk uh, that I wrote last year um, uh, talks about exactly how to do all of that sort of stuff. And then the um, uh, legal harms uh, uh, are coming out of uh, in kind of uh, different organizational processes. So the remedy is also kind of uh, an organizational governance sort of approach. Um, so let me um, go through some of these. But before I do, uh, any uh, questions that anyone wants to ask? Or um, we can do it now, we can do it at the end, uh, whatever works. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned at the beginning the 0. 0.4 cents cost. Yeah. Who's paying that? Uh, when, you, when you're using ChatGPT, OpenAI is paying for it. Uh, OpenAI is the, is the company that owns it? Yes, okay. yes. OpenAI is the company. So why? Why? It's a good question. Um, I mean, they do. They are starting to charge, I think, $20 a month or something. So, I mean, they're getting some revenue, but they're losing money uh, just keeping these models up, right? Yeah, so, um, yeah, I mean, it's a good question. Uh, a lot of companies, uh, I mean, lose a lot of money um, in the tech industry. It's kind of the way that they, uh, they bootstrap themselves. But, uh, yeah, no, I mean, uh, there's many companies that are realizing the, these costs, and uh, they're the ones that aren't willing to just spend money um, ad nauseum are uh, really understanding that uh, if they want their own model uh, for themselves, that they can't have such huge models, uh, that they do need to, to reduce the costs. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. This may be a little too general for where yeah. you're at. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I'm very curious about something. Yeah. It's what people talk about all the time. Yeah. The whole area of building guardrails. Mm -hmm. You know, you've obviously yeah. shown us here mm -hmm. the issues yeah. that exist. Yeah. But it, it begs the question. Yes. Who is responsible yeah. for building the guardrail? Yep. Yeah. And what are the issues involved with that? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to cover that. So keep uh, yeah, keep uh, listening for, for that. Keep thinking yeah. about it. Yeah, exactly, okay. exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. How many large language models are out in the marketplace? Yeah, there's a lot. Um, so uh, there's this uh, again, this company that's losing a lot of money. Um, it's called Hugging Face, and. Uh, they're a re repository of what's called open source models. Uh, so uh, they have, uh, I don't know, like thousands of uh, these uh, large language models on the, the Hugging Face repository. So um, yeah, it's not a small number. Um, the very largest ones, like uh, the, the GPT-4, which uh, uh, is kind of behind ChatGPT, um, uh, there's not any that are that size. Um, that has, in terms of looking, the way we calculate size is in terms of the number of parameters, and uh, uh, the GPT-4 has probably a, a trillion parameters or so. Um, uh, most of the models that uh, we're talking about that are on Hugging Face are, let's say, 10 billion parameters. Um, so uh, there's a lot of that size model, um, but uh, yeah, I mean, the hugest of them, there's very few, but uh, I mean, there's, there's plenty, actually. All right, so let's get into uh, who puts in the guardrails, how do we do it, right? Um, so how do we do it? Uh, so uh, if we think about these models as uh, uh, similar to, uh, to kind of uh, a, a child in a sense, right? So uh, what happens with a child? First they figure out, I mean, how to repeat some words, um, then they figure out uh, how to follow instructions. So like, if you tell a kid put the cup on the table, maybe they'll do it half the time. Um, and uh, then they start chatting with you back and forth, right? Um, and it's only at that point that uh, that you think about, I mean, teaching them your morals, your culture, your um, uh, different skills, I mean, uh, and, and so forth. And these large language models are kind of the same, right? Uh, so uh, there's kind of this idea about mitigators, so stopping the model from doing wrong things, but then there's also teaching them, so teaching them how to behave and then uh, assessing whether they've actually learned what you wanted to teach them. Right? Uh, so let me go through um, this, let me skip this slide, um, uh, and let me skip this one as well. So. Um, uh, let me give you a few examples of uh, what I'm talking about, right? 
in terms of mitigators first. Uh, so uh, if we wanted to know um, whether something is factual or not, so this is an example that we uh, are running internally. Uh, it's for human resources related um, interactions. All right? uh, so an employee can ask, uh, what is the Roth IRA limit, income limit this year? Good. Um, so let's start on the top right. Uh, so there's two possible responses. One is that you're single, so the limit is uh, $144,000, right? The other possible answer is $153,000. And at some point in time, the first one, the 144, used to be correct. Um, and in a couple of months, I think I'll have to change my example because this 153 number is uh, the 2023 number, right? Um, so what we've developed are uh, technologies that will check the factuality of these statements and give you a score between zero and one. Uh, so maybe the actual correct one in the, uh, our system will think that's 89% uh, chance of uh, being right. And uh, for the wrong one, maybe it'll say it's a 32% chance. Okay. So we can do, like this is an example of a guardrail, so it'll kind of check and then uh, if it's too false or too, um, I mean, unfaithful, then uh, maybe uh, the model will not uh, give you the answer. Okay? We can do other things as well. But, um, moving to the bottom right, uh, so this is another example. Um, so here it's kind of this bullying behavior sort of thing, right? So we've developed some detectors that will actually follow a conversation and see if it's kind of veering off into some egregious uh, sort of territory. So the example here is, um, so I mean, first gives an answer about uh, uh, the income limit for single people, then the user says that I'm getting married next week, and then it just goes in some weird direction, right? So um, uh, the model is claiming that no, you're not, and, and so forth, right? Um, so we do have ways of detecting this because um, we have enough examples that uh, uh, we've labeled uh, to show that no, this is what it means to be uh, a bad conversation, this is what it means to be a good conversation, it comes up. Uh, we're able to, to detect. Um, another way that we kind of deal with hallucination and uh, lack of factuality is um, uh, by tracing things back to where did the source information come from, right? So same question, we got the answer correct, but um, the question is which document in that entire internet uh, corpus um, led us to, to that answer, right? Uh, so we've been developing these methods that will actually um, kind of figure out where did the, uh, the information come from. So there was some influential uh, training data point uh, that uh, actually told us where, where the information came from. Right, so this is very explicit sort of guardrails, mitigators that um, are for um, the kind of known issues, the general um, sort of harms, okay? Questions? Yeah. How are you not doubling, so who, what's making that determination? You're not having somebody sit there and look at it, are you? Uh, for which one? So, uh, for well, either a quarter. Yeah. Um, so no. Um, so in terms of where did the information come from? So uh, we actually use uh, some mathematical operations to uh, uh, trace back um, the influence. Uh, so I can tell you in gory it detail. Just, it just uh, feels like it's doubling it, it, down. On, mm -hmm. It's almost like you've got. Mm -hmm. An AI on top of the AI. Uh, in the uh, the bottom left, it is not the case, but in the uh, the two on the right, that is true. Um, so we do have another AI which we've um, uh, trained to uh, detect these uh, these bad behaviors. So it's not one that's these large language models. It's a tiny sort of model that uh, is not based on the self-supervised learning either. It's uh, kind of being taught explicitly what is the right and the wrong. So. Um, uh, it's not going to fail in, in the ways that uh, we would expect the large language models to. Um, right, so in terms of uh, those, uh, I mean, kind of uh, uh, the explicit mitigators, that's when we know what the harm is specifically that we're trying to avoid. Um, so those are for the, uh, the general harms, the ones that we can list on the, te the taxonomy. Uh, but what we see is that we also want to be able to deal with the, the unique harms, the, the unique regulations that uh, different companies, different societies, uh, different legal structures want to deal with, right? Um, so if we look at uh, OpenAI, 
which, uh, as I said before, is the company behind ChatGPT. Um, there's other companies, uh, Facebook slash Meta, there's another company, Anthropic. Um, all of them are kind of dealing with these generic, sort of general sort of safeguards. Okay? Um, and what we've been working on is uh, something a little bit different, and that's uh, to deal with this fact that, not, that these policies are not as generic as just don't be evil. Okay? Uh, so as I said before, the desired behaviors um, should be shaped by principles, beliefs, norms, policies, values. Um, uh, and they could be coming from laws, from industry standards, corporate policies, etc. Right? Uh, even from psychiatry, I think um, the, some of the examples I showed for gaslighting and stuff, you know, so the model actually undergoing therapy would probably be a good thing. Right? Um, so, uh, so all of these um, sort of inputs are uh, required to get the, the model to, to behave better. And uh, uh, what we're creating right now is something we're calling an alignment studio. So it has uh, three components. Uh, so we call them the framers, the instructors, and the auditors. Um, so the term framers is, uh, just think about like, uh, the framing of the constitution, right? Um, so uh, what we need to do is define for uh, a particular deployment, what is the good and the bad? What is the desired and undesired behaviors? And it's not really um, something where we want to overburden um, the end users to do. Uh, so if they already have some existing policy documents or other things, then we want to be able to uh, uh, very naturally process them in a way such that we can instruct the models to, to follow those behaviors. So that's what Framers is about. Um, what Instructors is about is, uh, so Framers you can think of like kind of setting the curriculum, right? Um, instructors is then actually teaching the curriculum, right? Uh, one thing we've been working on there is um, uh, the fact that uh, there might be conflicting policies, right? So just think mm -hmm. about uh, any law that exists for, and you actually are in multiple jurisdictions at the same time. Sometimes those laws actually don't, uh, aren't coherent, right? Um, or maybe your company's policy is in conflict with some uh, uh, something else, right? So what we're working on is how to make sure that uh, when we have conflicts among different policies that uh, uh, we're able to choose the right one based on uh, what the context is um, in the situation. Okay? And then auditors is all about uh, kind of testing uh, what you taught, right? So just like with kids, um, we have to uh, test them for, for what we taught them. So uh, that's where auditors comes in. and. Uh, this has to be, again, unique because what we're teaching is unique. Uh, so we can't rely on uh, benchmarks and other sort of uh, things that exist for the common generic sort of norms because uh, uh, this isn't that great. Right? Uh, so this is uh, uh, something that I work on every day. Um, uh, so that kind of is the, uh, the purple box. So uh, how do we prevent discrimination, <laughs> hate speech, exclusion, that sort of stuff, right? Um, so then moving to the uh, um, so one thing that uh, we're working on here, um, so IBM uh, just released its own model, uh, similar to ChatGPT, it's called the Granite model. Uh, so this came out about three weeks ago or so. Um, and uh, that is very similar, it works the same way as uh, GPT and so forth. Um, we happen to use some geology-based uh, naming schemes, but um, uh, you can imagine that uh, our granite model works basically the same uh, as uh, as ChatGPT, right? Um, so what we're figuring out now is what we're calling these gemstones, okay? Uh, so these are models, these are LLMs that are going to work very differently than the way ChatGPT works. And by design, we want them to actually um, avoid this hallucination problem, this uh, leakage of private information problem, and so forth. And the way that, that we're thinking about it is uh, in analogy with how our brain works. So we have a part of the brain called the neocortex, which is what uh, processes language. Um, it's what allows us to have grammar and syntax and fluency in our language and so forth, right? And then there's another part of the brain, uh, which is the hippocampus. And what that does is it consolidates memories. Um, so the actual information, um, not like how words are put together. Uh, so when we think about the way that uh, the ChatGPT works right now, um, it's basically doing everything in one system. So it's trying to uh, process language and keep track of the information in, in one thing. 
and it's not successful at doing it because um, uh, it mixes together all sorts of weird pieces of information in some weird way and produces the output. So um, if we have two different modules, one for the memory and one for the language, then uh, we can store the facts, the information in that memory component, uh, the hippocampus-inspired uh, one, uh, and then we can validate the information there, um, do a bunch of operations there, and then just use the language part for making a, a fluid response. So uh, that's something that we're uh, in the middle of uh, developing some, some new ideas on. Um, and then um, in terms of the legal harms, um, so this requires kind of thinking through the entire um, sort of process, the life cycle, um, starting from scratch, what are all of the things that uh, go on before the model is released and also after it's released to, to keep improving it. Um, uh, this isn't meant to be read necessarily, but um, uh, the point is that uh, there's a lot of sort of interventions, a lot of uh, checks and balances to put in throughout the process, um, a bunch of testing to do throughout. Uh, and once we do that, uh, uh, we can get uh, more kind of safer and more trustworthy sort of models. Oh, yeah. yeah. How is the concept of the passage of time and the change of information mm -hmm. and history yeah. handled? And isn't that yeah. one of the, for me, it's yeah. the biggest problem yeah. in trying to research anything online? Yeah. I find mm -hmm. the wealth of information yeah. and some of it is so dated that it's yeah. just not true anymore. Yeah, no, that's a very good point. Um, so uh, in terms of keeping the memory separate from uh, the language, that will actually help us because then we can look and see, I mean, exactly know the date of a piece of information, and then if it's uh, too dated, we can uh, purge it from the memory or uh, kind of uh, reduce its, uh, its influence and so forth. So that is definitely one way to do it. Um, another way to do it is, um, uh, kind of a little bit more nuanced, like some things don't change over time. Like if I wanted to learn about, uh, I don't know, um, gra gravity or uh, I don't know, chlorophyll or I don't know, whatever, um, it might not have changed uh, a lot over time. So, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, it's a good question. I don't think we have the greatest of answers, but uh, it's something that definitely relates to attributing the source and kind of knowing um, when and where did that information Um, all right, so then the last one, the socioeconomic mm -hmm. harms. Uh, so this, as I mentioned before, um, so this is covered in a very long book. Um, so uh, uh, this is available on Amazon um, at the cheapest possible uh, it could be uh, to uh, discover the printing costs. So it's less than uh, $7. And um, uh, basically, when we can talk about making explicit decisions, uh, so loan approval, hiring decisions, uh, parole decisions, uh, all sorts of things of that sort. Uh, uh, then uh, it's a different sort of ball game than uh, this generative AI, uh, where the model is creating sentences uh, out of nothing. So there, it's uh, a little bit different way of, of doing things, but it's something that we've uh, uh, developed a lot of algorithms and a lot of methods for over the last uh, eight to ten years. All right, um, so I'm going to switch gears a little bit um, towards the end, um, take a little bit more of a uh, philosophical view on, on some things. Um, uh, so, uh, so bear with me on that, right? Uh, so one thing that I'll say is that um, AI itself is uh, somewhat value-laden, and the term that there should be artificial intelligence um, kind of reflects uh, a legacy of dominance hierarchies, um, such as man over nature and, uh, and others. And um, the fact that, I mean, we don't believe that there is intelligence elsewhere other than humans is kind of this, uh, this, this dominance uh, hierarchy, right? Um, we see it in, uh, I mean, other uh, hierarchies as well, whether it's uh, patriarchy, colonialism, racism, etc. Okay. Uh, so the, uh, the person, I mean, who I'm citing here, he's a philosopher at Oxford, Stephen Kay. All right. So um, when we think about that uh, sort of historical dominance, um, it's actually getting more and more entrenched um, in the age of these, uh, these large language models. And uh, there's been uh, empirical studies in the last couple of years that uh, 
illustrate that uh, these large language models have sociopolitical biases that favor dominant groups in terms of the information content that they have. Um, uh, when we're talking about morality, um, they're again capturing the dominant uh, sort of languages and cultures, but uh, not reflecting cultural uh, uh, differences. Okay. Um, so people have known this for a while. It's not a new idea. Um, but uh, the new idea is people had thought a few years ago that um, uh, the, the sort of problem was arising from the training data. Right? So from all of those um, pieces of text downloaded from the internet, that, uh, that's where all of the uh, this sort of uh, hegemony and, and stuff is coming from, right? Um, and specifically, uh, there was a paper um, maybe four years ago now, three, yeah, I think it's four years ago now, uh, which was explicitly pointing to the, the training data. But uh, uh, what I'll argue is that uh, it's actually um, a lot of this bad behavior is not necessarily because of the training data, but it's because of the human feedback. So when we're, we're talking about uh, instituting those guardrails, um, some of it is done by um, humans providing judgments on that. Uh, uh, what is good and what is bad and so forth. And uh, a lot of the humans doing this for, let's say, OpenAI or for Anthropic uh, and, and so forth um, are people who um, are instructed in very specific ways uh, to, that, that this is what they have to say is right and wrong. And uh, uh, often they're uh, low-wage workers in, uh, in the global south. Right? Um, so, like I said, I mean, this whole um, way of doing alignment or uh, instructing these models to behave with uh, these different companies uh, has been done uh, with, a, with a human feedback sort of uh, sort of version, and that's I think where, where more of the uh, the problems are coming. Right? And if we start thinking about this for a while, um, so we have these powerful companies. We have uh, uh, even if they're losing billions of dollars per day, they're very powerful. Um, uh, so it's kind of recapitulating uh, the past of uh, exploitation colonialism. Uh, so there's these small number of powerful companies who are using these workers um, and they're laboring to give that human feedback, um, but the benefit, the, the power and wealth accrues to those uh, powerful companies, uh, while very little of it, um, it's like less than $2 a day or something is accruing to the, to the workers. and. There's a lot of negative externalities as well, um, in the sense that when you have to read, I mean, all sorts of uh, misogynistic content or uh, violent content or whatever, it uh, gives a lot of uh, mental health issues to, to the workers, right? So uh, a lot of uh, negativity in their communities. But, um, as I was saying, uh, the companies force the workers to project the company's own values into the feedback that they provide um, through very explicit sort of draconian measures. Sometimes they won't pay the worker at all for the last week if uh, uh, they started using their own mind rather than kind of uh, what the, uh, the company told them to, uh, to uh, include in the instructions, right? Um, so this is a sort of erasure of the actual personal values of the, of the workers. Uh, so what I would call this is um, a colonialist approach to AI alignment. Uh, and there has been prior work on AI and coloniality, um, but it hasn't focused on the, uh, the alignment problem. Um, but uh, but uh, what I'll kind of say more is that uh, historically, uh, colonialism altered the beliefs and values of colonized peoples. Um, so here's a quote from a paper uh, talking about, uh, about Africa. So um, I'll read it out loud. So it says that uh, colonial rule disrupted the traditional machinery of moral homogeneity and practice. The method of moral inculcation was vitiated, which resulted in the abandonment of traditional norms and values through a systematic depersonalization of the African and paganization of its values. And a very similar sort of description for India. Um, so Hindus adopted a West-centric frame for understanding their tradition as religious beliefs, as religious because of colonization. For Western colonialism to succeed, philosophy and exploitation, the South Asian world of philosophy has to be erased as it constitutes a critical arena for the West Bank to authority. Right? So um, kind of summarizing that, um, uh, when we think about what are the values that the tech companies um, 
are promoting, um, they're doing it, as I said before, very generically, very high level. They just want these models to be helpful and harmless and honest. Um, and the way that they make it seem is that they're very rational and secular and as unassailable at face value, just like a, a colonial power might have done. Um, so uh, they, but by doing so, they actually hide many undesirable behaviors because um, it's not clear who is it helpful to, um, who is it harmless to, um, and so forth. Um, so they've reduced this real world complexity into these abstract instructions, and they can shield their behaviors behind that. Right? And the second point is that um, a lot of the ways that uh, the sort of AI alignment is happening is kind of rooted in Western philosophy as the starting point. Um, so there's kind of three main branches of uh, Western philosophy. So there's deontology, consequentialism, and virtue ethics, and it's not so critical what the distinctions between the three are, but uh, just that the goal has traditionally in Western philosophy, philosophy been to have a universal philosophy. So uh, whatever those right actions, outcomes, or ideals might be, um, that they're universally seen. Um, there are some exceptions, but uh, that's the, the general trend. And by doing so, um, the co companies are pushing other philosophies uh, to, to the margins. Um, so, uh, the centering of Western philosophy uh, via colonialism is uh, as recapitulated uh, in what we're seeing right now. Um, so I'll offer somewhat of a, of a different view. Um, so instead of universalism, there is there are traditions out there um, that are very pluralistic, um, and one of those is uh, uh, the uh, the philosophy of harm. And in pre-colonial India, um, there was also this uh, general practice of argument of moral philosophy. Um, so this was part of how, how things happened. And uh, uh, it was not weird or unusual for a single individual person to hold contradictory views. Um, so uh, uh, there's uh, this uh, transcendentalist sort of quote that uh, I think consistency is the Foolish hop goblin of the mind. I forget exactly what uh, small that is. Minds. But small minds, right? Um, so I mean, there's no sort of uh, need for to, there to be a kind of universalism inside even a single person, right? I mean, it's fine to have uh, your own contra uh, contradictory views, and this was kind of how um, uh, philosophy was seen uh, in pre-colonial India, right? Um, so specifically, if we map what I was saying. Uh, few minutes ago to, between the common universally good actions and outcomes and the unique particular ones. Um, uh, there is actually the same dichotomy that uh, occurs in uh, this uh, dharma uh, philosophy. So there's two kinds. There's uh, sadharan dharma and there's vishesh dharma. And um, they actually exactly map in the same exact way. Um, so uh, everything that I was saying before, this alignment studio and so forth, is exactly what uh, I'm kind of proposing in a decolonial philosophical way as well. Um, uh, another thing that uh, exists in Western philosophy is uh, the starting point with uh, logos, uh, which is a Greek word um, uh, which uh, conflates thought with language. So kind of anything that you think should be um, kind of expressible in language, but it doesn't have to be the case, right? So. We look at uh, other pre-colonial societies. Uh, they were able to depict their moral values through all sorts of other things, so whether it was dance or rituals, paintings, mass rhythms, uh, even body parts, silence. Um, I mean, all sorts of things, right? And uh, uh, this image here um, is uh, of this person, Valmiki, uh, uh, and he's uh, purported to have invented verse. Um, so he said the first poem, and it was in uh, response to uh, and witnessing the killing of, uh, of a mating bird and his moral outrage toward it. And so even poetry itself, um, I mean, kind of is uh, uh, rooted in, in morality, right? Um, so what that brings me to is um, kind of a proposal of a solution that uh, reimagines and reconstitutes um, three aspects of uh, kind of controlling or aligning the behaviors of, uh, of large language models. Um, so one is that the base moral philosophy be pluralistic. Um, so allow for these unique um, sort of uh, 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 sort of uh, requirements, values, and so forth. Um, 
Uh, another is that uh, this tradition of argumentation be upheld. So um, uh, it be okay that there's differences in opinion in uh, what's right or good, um, and that there could be argument upon them. Right? And the last is that uh, val uh, valid sources of knowledge um, to use in the argumentation be brought in to not just be instructions or commandments, um, uh, but allow for storytelling or paintings or other things to be used as uh, instructions for uh, for morality. So all of these things are kind of uh, what we're working on um, with the with the Alignment Studio, but um, uh, this is kind of a, of a different view on it. So. Uh, let me end there, and uh, happy to uh, to take further questions. Thank you.